Welcome back. I hope you're all staying safe. I hope you are making it through an incredibly difficult time for our country. And I hope that you are finding encouragement and life in the videos that we've been releasing lately. Today, I'm going to introduce you to a new friend of mine. He is a diehard Yankees fan, which automatically makes him a brother to me. He is a keynote speaker, a coach, and a published author, and a true expert in dealing with lots of issues that you and I and our general public deal with. Throughout the video interview, we'll show a couple of clips of Tom as well being interviewed or speaking, and you'll see the caring heart, the concern he has for both sides of the equation. I know that you will find this to be a new resource to help you and maybe even help your significant other heal. He not only has a master's degree in social work, he not only facilitates groups for men and women, but he also cares for the addict. He deals and specializes in intimacy, avoidance, and intimacy issues of all sorts. And he's someone that I have come to rely upon for great truth, great encouragement, and expert perspective to help you that are dealing with addiction issues, whether you're betrayed or whether you're unfaithful, as well as dealing with family of origin issues and childhood trauma. My guest today via Zoom is Thomas Gagliano. A cemetery is filled with addicts that thought they can handle their addiction again. Hi, I'm Jenny McCarthy. What brings me here on this video today is to introduce an amazing therapist, friend, self-help guru, best-selling author, Tom Gagliano. I'm joined by Thomas Gagliano. I am joined by Tom Gagliano. I got so much positive feedback about the segment that I decided to invite back Thomas Gagliano. See, addictions aren't the problem, they're the symptoms. What's the problem is, I believe, and how I help others is to know that it's an emotional crippleness. And that's really what creates the symptom of addiction. Tom, I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I've already, I've already introduced you off camera. Uh, the thing I would love about you is East Coast. You're a diehard Yankee fan, so we've already lost some viewers, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Maybe they'll stick around a little bit longer. But, man, you're an author. You're a coach. Uh, you help those in crisis. I've watched a number of your videos, and I just think you're brilliant. And so Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here. Why don't you take a couple of moments, share with the viewers, you know, a little bit about your journey and what you do and just kind of take it away. Thank you. Well, uh, again, my name's Tom Gagliano. I have a master's degree in social work. Uh, and I was in the, uh, in the beginning of my career, I was a businessman. I did very well, but I sabotaged my life uh, with addictions. And, and I guess about 15 years ago, I realized that uh, it wasn't working for me. And I had two goals. One goal was to help other people that suffered from negative childhood messages as I did. And the other goal was to give my children a safe place, a place to share their feelings, a place I never had as a kid. And that's when I started to get into this work. Um, I help a lot of couples men back broken relationships. It could be on betrayal. It could be in a lot of different things. Um, and my ideology all begins with family messages, early childhood messages. Um, so You'll understand the solution I talk about better if I explain the problem. Because uh, to mend back any broken relationship, it takes courage and it takes two kinds of willingness. The willingness to get and seek help and the willingness to take direction. And that can be a little tough because many of us don't trust any process that we can't control. So Say that again, Tom. Say that again because you're yeah. exactly – I was watching one of your videos where you said that we – can't we find it hard to trust a process we're not in control of because we come from fears of the unknown and many times fears give us a bad ending to everything if we allow others to guide us in our recovery in our marriage and in mending back a relationship uh, but i'm going to give your viewers a nice little surprise at the end of this interview uh, a happy surprise on, on how well um, they could do if they do follow direction so first and foremost, everything begins in the home, in my opinion, everything. And it starts with childhood messages, nonverbal and verbal. They don't always have to be verbal. They right. could be books parents give us, uh, 
rolling of the eyes, disappointments. So it's really important to understand that childhood messages impact every part of our life to the intimacy we have or don't have, our parenting skills, the careers we choose, everything. So let's begin early on. Children are egocentric. I want to explain what that means. The world revolves around them. When I was a kid and my father was out drinking, womanizing, and gambling, I never said at 10 years old, she, my father's an alcoholic. He has issues. I said, what's the matter with me? Mm. Something must be wrong with me or he wouldn't be doing this. Wow. What I tell clients all the time, and here's a big sentence. Please hear this. When a child feels like they don't matter to their parents, it's not their parents they stop loving. It's themselves they stop loving. It's so true. So right, na- right at that point, we're developing a negative sense of self, the child. They begin to become fragmented. What's fragmented? They split into two. They show the world one part of themselves, but they dare not let anybody see their insides because they're so afraid of getting rejected. They're so afraid of getting let down. That's not going to work good when you grow up into intimacy. It's just not going to work. We didn't talk about this off camera, Tom, but it's funny that you mentioned that because there's a gentleman named Wayne and all of our viewers know him. He does a lot of our um, weekly videos. He's done some childhood trauma work with me. And I'll tell you what, I mean, your big sentence, it is so true because I had such a struggle with self-rejection and self-hatred, but it was only that when I went through some ETT and went through some really deep emotional healing that I started to see when I started to reject myself. I think that message that you just kind of tapped into is so true. It doesn't, and I know that you'll get to this, it doesn't mean that it's an excuse for us acting out. It doesn't mean that it's a justification. Well, I just have this childhood stuff. But it is understanding that if we as unfaithful or addicts don't understand why we do what we do, how are we going to stop doing it? How are we going to heal, right? I mentioned these three essentials in my book, self-awareness, action, and maintenance. Without self-awareness, I don't know what actions to take. And without actions, there's nothing to maintain. So the consistency of taking healthy actions can silence the intrusive voices that I call the warden. That's that... In my book, The Problem Was Me, that's that fictitious character that's always telling us we're not good enough. Many clients come to me and the husband or the wife, their their listening filters are so distorted. The wife could say something like, you didn't take out the garbage. And the husband hears, you just said I'm a defective husband. No, we're not only in a relationship with our partner. We're in a relationship with our partner's childhood messages as well. And they're in a relationship with our messages as well. I tell clients that all the time. So when we're growing up and we're looking at not only how our father deals with us or how our mother deals with us or one parent childhood, but we're looking how they deal with each other. That's how we're developing this version of intimacy that we bring into adult life. Are they working out their conflict, regulating their discomfort with each other? Are they happier when they talk about their feelings to each other? Does one shut down? Does one run away to an addiction or an affair? Does one rage in anger? What are they doing? Because when we get older and we get afraid, that little kid inside of us is going to come up and tell us to do the same self-survival mechanisms we learned as a child. Perfect way to sabotage our relationship. So we have to, as you said, be aware of what we saw in our childhood as we develop our version of intimacy as an adult because it's going to show up. You can't deny it, manipulate it, or think it's not, it's not going to show up. It's going to show up. Now, what addicts don't know how to do, and I'll talk about myself, I didn't know how to regulate discomfort. Never knew how to do that. When I was discomforted, I didn't trust any process that was going to help me. So I ran away to medicate that in different ways. That's what addicts do. Even betrayal. When we get older and we get into relationships, so does stresses, tensions, conflicts, conflicts with children, with money, with this, with that. If I, don't, if I never learned how to regulate that discomfort in a healthy way as a child, I'm more prone to acting it out with affairs, pornography, uh, massage parlors, drinking, drugs, whatever it is. Because I'm going to time travel back 
to that little kid that says something bad is going to happen. Now, unless people have a perfect life out there, you got to learn to deal with life on life's terms. And we as, as addicts have to learn that and not act it out, talk I, about it, process it. I, I think that's so good. And you mentioned being fragmented. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to actually have our producer show a, one of your videos when you talk about being fragmented. So we'll take a break here and listen to you in uh, one of your talks. If you notice, if you know somebody that's an addict, you'll notice that they're probably very self-centered. They probably don't trust anything they can't control. You'll notice that they isolate. They stay apart from people. These are common traits of those that are addicts. And remember, it's not because they're not bad people. They're really scared people. That's what makes it hard for an addict to get help. Because if they go to a therapist, a 12-step group, a priest, a minister, a rabbi, they got to give up control. They don't like that. They don't trust that. Coming back, Tom, you know, when you really start to wrap your mind around the journey of the betrayed spouse as, as it relates to the unfaithful, I have so many betrayeds who will reach out to me because here's the thing right there's a lot of messages out there about addiction sex addict i mean in my opinion the two most overdiagnosed kind of you know diagnoses is if if you will is narcissism and sex addict right they think if my spouse has an affair they must be a narcissist they're probably a sex addict and they're off to the races and i really have so much compassion for the betrayed spouse who is is kind of the spouse of an addict because their journey has some nuances to it. It is different. So we'll come back to the unfaithful, but for the betrayed who is married to an addict, what are some of the keys that really help, can help them heal? Because they kind of get a one size fits all message from people that are not experts, right? Forgive, move on, do some work and forget about it. Stop no. talking about it which is a nightmare. Absolutely. So if you were to, to share a few good, helpful, you know, suggestions for the betrayed, male or female, he is married to an addict, what are they? Here's the most important thing where my heart, as you said, goes out to them. Because many times they are the victims, many times, and they have to get help for themselves. That's hard to do. When somebody is the victim and yet, my actions mean I need to work on myself. It's like, wait, this isn't fair. They did this to me. Why do I have to do this? I could tell everyone out there, please, take that leap of faith. Work on yourself, regardless of what your betrayer does. Work on fixing the most important relationship you have, and it's not with them, it's with you. Work on yourself. Get therapy, get help, focus on yourself. Many times, when the, this occurs, the person betrayed thinks, I'm going to love them to health, mm. okay? Or they think, I'm going to control them to health. I'll just tell them what to do. Or they think, I'm going to cure them. And sadly enough, some think they're the cause. If only I was pretty enough, or sexy enough, or smart enough. And they don't understand. You need to get educated on what this is about. This is about acting out a brokenness inside. It's really about that. It's not about um, sex and all these other things. Now, there are some affairs that, listen, are different. You know, a person could be in an affair with someone because they're in the wrong marriage or wrong relationship, and they really do love that person. I'm not talking about that. That happens. We make mistakes in life. And if that happens, maybe you need to get divorced and walk out the front door instead of sneaking around the back door. I know there's kids involved. Maybe that's easier to said than done. But not all affairs are, are necessarily addictive in nature. Right. Most are an acting out process, again, when we can't deal with discomfort. So what happens to the person in the relationship is the first thing is I'll control him or I'll cure him or and all of that stuff is just more torture and more pain. Let me stop so, you and ask you this, yeah. because I think you said something and for the viewers. We didn't talk about this, but for my betrayed males out there, listen, you hear lots of people that will say that him or what have you, we completely understand that you can feel 
isolated as a betrayed male. Please don't read into our vernacular or our verbiage. We completely understand. Absolutely. There are hundreds of you that are out there that are betrayed males that feel just left out, but please stay with us. We see you, we love you, we're here for you. I just did an interview with a gentleman, Alejandro, who was a betrayed male spouse that just lit my computer on fire. He was so encouraging. But you said something, Tom, that was brilliant, because I think this is a big faction for what we see. And I, I wanna be delicate, but why do the betrayed think that they can love their spouse into healing or love them into no longer acting out? What drives that? Is it, is it just naivety? Is it just confusion? Is it control? Kind of a, it's a you all know. about fear. Mm. False evidence appearing real. And fear underneath manifests itself with control. If I can control him, I'm going to be okay. If I can control her, I'm going to be okay. Control is uncontrollable. It never works. Hmm. So the more scared a person is inside and insecure, the more they will think, think the solution is control. I'm going to control them. I'm going to watch everything they do. It doesn't work. So when I have a couple come into me and when they say, okay, we've had betrayal and I have women, men, you're right, both. I say one important question. Are you in the relationship or not? Mm. Make the choice. If you're not in the relationship, then you go your separate ways. You get individual help because I think everybody should. And you build a better relationship with yourself so you could make better choices and not the same choices. If you're in the relationship, I then ask the next question. What actions are you going to take? You can't just say I'm in and we're done and walk out the door. What actions are you going to take? to show your partner, the betrayed one, that you're in the relationship. That's where healing can begin. If that person says, I'm willing to go to 12-step meetings, I'm willing to get a therapist, I'm willing to work on myself, I'm work willing to go into one of this guy Tom's group with other people, like-minded people. If they put actions down, they're showing you that you are a priority now, which you were never in a betrayed relationship. But in the relationship means actions. Or you can take the, I don't force anybody to make that call. You could say, I'm out of the relationship. Then you take those actions to get out of the relationship. Right. And when you're in, I suggest therapy. As you said, we need to look at addictions as symptoms. They're not the problem. Mm. Okay, the problem is the brokenness inside. Now, I may act it out with drinking, sex, drugs, gambling. Those are symptoms. And let me tell you, I may stop one and think I'm okay and just switch seats in a Titanic, right. which generally isn't going to help my situation. Right. So, so when they start recovery, the very first thing is the betrayer needs to stop betraying. Yeah. Obviously. It's obvious, but it's got to be said. What does that mean? That means any devices, anything you do, we go to the other partner. What do you need to feel safe here? Right. It is a little controlling, but I need them to go on less business trips. I need them to filter their computer when they go up in the room and they're on the computer and I don't see any. What do you need? We're looking to make the betrayer make the betrayed their priority now. I'm doing what I need to do to what? To gain back your trust. Yeah. And I need to do that in actions. Right. Now, if they get that far and it takes courage, and what did I say? The willingness to take direction. I may tell you to do things you don't want to do. Right. But I hope gonna, you do. Yeah. Absolutely. But I'm not going to say do it if you feel like doing it. Right. I'm going to say you want to get better. You need to trust me, this process that you're not going to be in control of. And if that happens, and if the person is willing to do that and works on themselves, and it takes time, it takes, I'd say, nine months to a year of diligently structuring themselves around this process as being their priority. The good news is then they get into regular marriage sessions where everybody's got to work on what they need to do to make the relationship better. Remember what I said, if you're in, both need to work on what they need to do to make it better. And here's the ending of the story. I've had clients that when they've done this have told me that they've had, they have a better relationship than they ever thought possible. And the reason why is because this makes you work on things you would have never worked on. Right. 
So it makes you take that inventory and have what I call, Sam, is those uncomfortable conversations because the key to true intimacy is to have uncomfortable conversations and not run away like we didn't do as children. And that's, I think that's so good that the child inside of us, I know that the child inside of me, the child inside of my wife, Samantha, can fight. Woo, let me tell you, we, I'm Mike Tyson, my child is Mike Tyson, and her child is Evander Holyfield, and we bite each other, and boy, we go at it. Now, let me kind of land this plane. Now, I'm, I'm not necessarily an addict. I, I, I wouldn't call myself a sex addict. I wasn't diagnosed that, but I have lots of people that come this way. So let me ask you that lots of people that come this way who are true addicts and who are spouses of addicts. So I'm going to ask you, we didn't even talk about this, but I know that you know the answer, but here's a question to two parts. Number one, is there hope for the addict that really wants to get healthy? And number two, I know that the answer to that is yes, but can you give some hope to the betrayed spouse for how that there is hope for a marriage where there is a true addict involved in the marriage? Yeah. First, to understand, you need to detach with love. Hmm. That means focus on yourself. Hmm. Even though it's hard because you want to keep looking left and seeing what they're doing and you wanna control them, it's normal. I wanna to say to everybody, it's normal to wanna to control. It's normal to wanna to cure them. But that's not the path to healing. The path to healing, again, is for the betrayer to get their own support group. What I call witnesses. Witnesses are those people out there that know your truth. Mm. My betrayers are in groups. There's not a secret they don't know about each other. And what's important is they stop the addictive ritual because that's addictive. The mm. ritual. What starts it? A discomfort. Not when I'm ready to go meet somebody in a hotel or go to the massage parlor. It starts with a discomfort. We grow in that. For the one that's being betrayed, they need to speak to other like-minded people as well. I love Al-Anon. It's Codependency Anonymous. If you can't afford a therapist. So you need to, instead of falling back to your knee-jerk reaction to control and cure and, and, and fix it, you need your support group that you can go to that gets you. My God, that's horrible. You've been so hurt and you're bleeding and I hear you. I'm sorry, but this didn't work for me. This is what worked for me. So you, we all need support groups, whether we're the betrayer or the betrayed. Supportive people I call witnesses. Witnesses are those that you let inside of you that know your truth, that you could call them and not feel judged. You don't go to a, a, a relative or a friend that's going to say, well, you shouldn't have did that. You shouldn't have did that. That's not support. Support is somebody that says, I'm sorry you're suffering here. I get it. How can I help you? Here's what worked for me. Here's what didn't work for me. So the betrayer, the betrayed needs a support group detached from the, the person that does the portraying just as much, attached right. with love. And if both work on themselves, this happens. Intimacy can begin. And I can tell you, you said something really important. There's nothing more important than the willingness to want to get better, not the need to get better. There's plenty of people out there that need to get better. It's those that want to get better. Those are the ones that I've seen miracles like you wouldn't believe, mm. would not believe because they wanted to. And the scary thing is they got to want it for themselves, not for their wife, not for their husband. Because if they're only doing it to get back in the house or get back in a relationship, that won't last. This is a life change, a transition where you heal what's broken inside or you'll switch seats in the Titanic. Trust me, you may stop the infidelity. You'll end up being a compulsive gambler, a drinker, or you'll act out in different ways. Let me ask you something. I think that's just spot on. Why do we as unfaithful or addicts or both, why do we want to hide in shame? Because you, 
alluded to the fact that your organization and what you do is, is so similar to us. We believe that we heal in groups. We believe that isolation oh, only you. festers shame. It only fe it creates the opportunity for even more shame, self-condemnation, self-hatred, all that. Why do we as addicts find it so hard to get into community? Why do we just think that we'll just white knuckle it? Why are we so stupid? Why do we think that we can just do it on our own? What makes us think that way, Tom? Because we're fragmented. Mm. Because the peace inside of us, the outside, we all have, all addicts have different masks. We come in different colors. We come in different religions. We come rich, we come poor. But on the inside is where we all identify. There's a brokenness in there. There's a rejection that we don't want to get close to anyone because they may find out who we really are and they're going to reject us. So whenever there's the time and place to let people in, we would rather isolate. You see, we're comfortable in isolation, but it's toxic. Yeah. We're uncomfortable in getting out of ourselves and becoming congruent and showing who we really are. That's healthy. I always tell my clients, that, that isolation seat, that victim seat, oh, it's so cushiony and nice and comfortable. That responsibility seat, damn that thing, the back, my back hurts. My, I don't want to go in that seat. Right. But that's the healthy seat. But for us, as children, in one way or the other, when we felt we didn't matter, we stopped trusting people. Addicts are emotional cripples. So when I stopped trusting people, Okay, addiction becomes an intimacy substitute. It substitutes the intimacy I could have with people. Wow. And that's why we'd rather be alone. That's, I mean, whew, I almost get emotional thinking about that because I know what it's like. One of the messages I received at, at a young age, growing up in the inner city and hiding from drive-by shooting, feeling alone, um, was just that I wasn't good enough, that I didn't matter, that I wasn't going to mean anything to anybody. I mean, I wrestled with suicide at a young age, and then I blow my life up in 2005, and the world comes crumbling down around me. Man, I immediately wanted to just hide and retreat. If it wasn't for my kids, if it wasn't for Samantha, if it wasn't for God's grace, I mean, I, I would have ended it all in a heartbeat. And I, I just resonate with that message of how fragmented we are. At the end of our video, I'm going to show another clip of you speaking and talking about fragmentation. My hope is that more of my viewing audience will become part of your viewing audience and watch more of your videos and that you would be another added resource to them. So I know that you don't like to do this, but I'm going to make you do it. Tell the viewers a little bit about your book. Give them the title. Talk a little bit about some of the messages in there because I, I want them to be able to get it and read it. And, and most of all, why we're doing this whole darn thing is to get healthier. Yeah. Well, y y I will tell you, my book is called The Problem Was Me. And it was a title my wife loved. She said, you finally got that right. I said, thank you, hon. So it's with a, a Dr. Abraham Tversky. My other book is called Don't Put Your Crap in Your Kid's Diaper. The cleanup course could last a lifetime. Now, my first book is, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a scenario real quick to show you. It's about my life story and the story of other men and women I've helped free themselves from those childhood messages. Real quick, when I was a kid, my father used to call me his little girl whenever I would show emotion. That's who he was. And I remembered this time, and this, I talk about this story in my book where we had to put my dog down. And my son was very, very close to the door, very close. I remember walking in his room and seeing he was teary-eyed. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm okay, dad. And I put his arms around me and he started to cry. Mm. And I knew at that moment, I was giving my son a safe place mm. just to cry in his father's arms. I never had that as a kid, but that's one of the things that I created with my children. And as much as I knew it was the right thing to do, it was tremendously uncomfortable because it wasn't the messages I received. So I think um, one of the things in my book is to challenge the ingrained messages we receive. Our parents gave us some good messages, but there's a few of them we need to check out a little bit and right. do some tweaking on. And that's what I tell people to do. And we're not going to want to do it. Don't wait till you feel like doing it. Just yeah. do it. You know, and it begins with self-awareness, gives us the actions we need to take, 
and then consistently taking those actions will change the role you were set up to play in your childhood. Tom, I can't thank you enough. I hope that you'll come back in as Absolutely. we as we talk about more and more of these messages. I'm always looking for people that I trust to bring information that is redemptive, restorative, and from people who've been through it. My video audience is so tired of healing from people, hearing from people who give advice about infidelity that have never been through infidelity. And that's why I think your message resonates with myself, with my viewing audience, because we're wrestling with things that are so much bigger than us. So yeah. Tom, thank you for coming in. I, I just can't thank you enough for your heart to give back. And I hope you'll come back in again soon. I would love to. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me.